Good afternoon, everyone. Good that we are gathered post lunch session. Hopefully, we'll be able to make up to this. Um, let me get the privilege of introducing the team. Before that, let me introduce myself. Myself is Kaushik Sengupta. I am uh, the Asia Pacific lead for business development for Netera uh, Telecommunications. And uh, here today we have gathered for a specific topic, which is new business models and investment strategies to meet cable future digital demand. So today I have with me specifically on this particular topic as a panelist, Mr. Thomas Lee uh, here, uh, Mr. Asmara, Eruma Asmara from CMI, uh, Mr. Ubaid Yunus from Meta, and Mr. Keith Wong, uh, from Lit Up Network. So I would request individually uh, our team uh, to uh, panelists to give us so a short introduction. Thomas, we go with you. Okay, thank you, Koshik. Uh, hi, hi everyone. I'm I'm Thomas Lee I'm from HEC Global Communications, based in Hong Kong. So uh, I think uh, I've done twenty years of uh, telecom experience. Um, at first in mobile, but um, later on in fixed network and also in the international carrier arena. So hopefully I can bring to the table some of my experiences in the, in the past few years. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Over to you, Asmar. Hi, nice to meet you all. My name is Iruma Asmar. I'm from China Mobile International, uh, based in Hong Kong, but uh, thanks to CMI, they allowed me to stay in my home country in Indonesia. So I've been uh, working for the submarine cable industry for at least 15 years. Before that, before joining CMI, I also working for NTT Communication. So we build a highway, let the people like him to sell everything. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Uh, so we pass to uh, Ubaid. Hi, um, I'm Ubaid Yunus. I'm part of uh, Meta. Um, Facebook. Um, I'm part of the infrastructure team there. I look after network investment and strategy for APAC region. Um, good to be here. Um, at Meta, obviously, we are uh, one of the leading um, investors in infrastructure uh, globally, uh, primarily uh, because we serve 3 billion um, users uh, throughout the world. And it's good to be part of this panel. Looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Keith, your turn. Hi, um, I'm Keith Wong from uh, LitUp Networks or LitUp Infrastructure. We are part of the Optic Marine Service Group, uh, OMS. I think you may have heard uh, we own the ships, the cable laying ships, the maintenance ship, and also the coastal barges. Okay, uh, for so we do a lot of the submarine cable projects uh, around the world. And lit up itself, we own a uh, cable landing station, we own uh, facilities uh, that we we provide for some of the uh, carriers and also for some of the OTT. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone, for their uh, short introduction. This brings me to this particular topic for today. Uh, I'll repeat the topic again, new business models and investment strategies to meet uh, cable future digital demand. Now, there had been a lot, uh, lot of different opinions in the market in terms of digitization, subsea, uh, capacity, cloud, all this lead to one simple thing, which is the transport. Without the transport, the layer one nothing would be possible to even create a cloud. Even though you have hardware, you have everything. If you don't have the basic connectivity to connect these clouds, these clouds have got no existence. Now to do that, we have like able pair panelists who would be giving their own opinion as well as their own experiences. And obviously with their market, uh, rich market experience and knowledge, they would be able to give more insights and bring on the table the actual, actual, trend which is ongoing in this market as well as how the future looks like so my first question to the panel would be to to thomas and asmara if you guys would be able to uh, add and rest team can also join on that how the business how can the business adapt their existing business models to meet the future digital demand on the cable industry thomas you want to go first okay of course 
Um, sorry, guys. Um, cheat sheets because uh, I woke up this morning in Hong Kong. I caught a very early flight, so I need this. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, the traditional model would be like um, connecting in Asia would be connecting the, the main hubs. So Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan. Those are the traditional main hubs. Right. But of course, with the, the new dig digital demand, we're seeing that demand being in every other country in cool. the region. So, of course, there has been cables uh, connecting to other countries in the Southeast Asia region, but we see that um, there is not enough. Um, looking at some uh, telegeography data in the past few years, we see the, the CAGA growth for the, the capacity demand and cable demand. We are talking about 40%, 50% every year. But if we look at the capacity and the leak capacity, it's nowhere near that. The gap is actually just becoming, becoming wider and wider. So uh, what we feel... Uh, of course, of course, uh, more than the traditional uh, hubs, we also need to connect the, the the emerging markets, those countries. But in terms of the business model, how um, some experience at HEC is, we feel that we want to build the in-country backhaul fiber first before we go in into the subsea, mm. because the in-country backhaul fiber once it's built, we can already start building customers. We can start selling it straight away. Whereas the subsidy takes a much longer time and the return on investment is much longer. So from our point of view, we built the, the in-country backhaul fiber first and then have, have that uh, business running already. Then we expand that into the subsidy arena. So do you think that uh, organically growing your domestic network first would create more value rather than investing? Because if, if you rightly, uh, if you have seen in the past, you will see that the demand on the subsea cable is like it's doubling or it's getting multifold. So is it that that um, the highway needs to be created uh, first uh, on the subsea or the domestic organic growth is needed first? I would I would think uh, I would think that um, we start from the, the basic layer first. So definitely the um, the uh, terrestrial backhaul fiber first. Okay. Before the subsea, and part of the the other reason is also um, uh, we've looked at different subsea cables in the past and different consortiums. Of course, there are happy stories. There are stories which are less happy because of a consortium fighting um, or conflicts in, in certain cable landing, certain countries. So from our point of view, we want to avoid those. <clears throat> so we go into it with the, the terrestrial cable first. We work with some local partners to get the cable landing running first before we go into the subsea. So it's a, a reverse in the, the flow. Actually, this brings to an important topic that the subsea capacities should propagate properly in within the country properly if you have a well-built network inside the country. That's a very good point. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Asmara, your opinion on this? Yeah, thanks. I, I am quite interested when Thomas mentioned, I mean, it's just a different approach, right? Uh, you can start thing from the terrestrial or you can start, of course, it's, it will be interconnecting each other actually. So uh, back to your question, how the submarine cable industry is adept to, uh, how to cater to the digital demand. Yeah, the digital demand. Uh, as I said in my introduction that we built a highway, right? So, and as you said during your introduction that without the submarine cable, the G digital will not, it's not be happening. Exactly. Right? So, uh, it's kind of like interdependence each other between the submarine submarine cable industry and the digitalization. In every country now, the digitalization is become very become very important, right? So how we adapt, we need to adapt. The submarine cable industry need to adapt with this demand. Right. So we are working like for example at CMI, we're not only working with uh you you call a cable company. Right. My 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 definition of cable company is more like the uh traditional telco company. Right. But now we are also working with the content provider. Mm -hmm. For example, with the guy who was sitting with him beside me, right? Right. You, you know that CMI has a, have collaboration a lot with with, with Meta. all the Meta, Google. See, uh, with this, I can come to a conclusion on, on your part that um, you can lay capacity, you can have plenty of fibers on the subsea, but if you don't have a proper content been driven or the data is missing on that highway, there's no point in deploying that, correct? Correct. So the surge is only for the, so we, we have less, less uh, 
demand we have more demand on the data and less amount of supply in terms of subsea so the point is how do you manage because even today if you have 50 submarine cables getting implemented this year still you will have a scarcity of capacity going forward like people are getting into 5g networks are getting deployed into 5g not every every country has 5g activated mm. the, but the moment the 5g comes into play the whole like explosion of of data would yeah, actually come in yes so there is a huge uh, point which which we want to understand from from our dear friend ubed ubed if you can just give some insights on this also um, how to manage and how this would meet the digital mm. future demand yeah um, thank you very much i have a slightly uh, with respect to my fellow panelists i think they all they have said is very relevant very true um I have a slightly different perspective. I think uh, what we have seen in the past five years or 10 years where there's a boom in the submarine infrastructure deployment, um, it is not primarily driven by the activities at the access end, okay? Um, and the, one, of the, uh, one of the proof to the, for the, that pudding would be that the traditional carriers have not increased their investment on a persistent basis. Um, you will find carriers still owning half of Abba Pair or one of Abba Pair. So right. they have not gone beyond what they were traditionally doing for the past 20, 25 years. So the excess and all the activity or all the new data surge is efficiently being managed by deployment of caches and POPs within the jurisdiction. And only five to 10% is actually translating into the IPT. What has generally driven uh, the, the investment in the submarine network is connectivity between the cloud hubs, connectivity between the data centers, connectivity at a different plane than the user plane. Okay. And that will continue to grow. And it, to my personal opinion, and I, I'm, I may be wrong on that, but I think 5G is for now is an extension to 4G, which just provides the better user experience to some of the usage or use cases of the 4G itself. Uh, it has not gone into putting into pressure any additional data on the international circuits or IPD per se. Uh, and obviously virtualization is something that people are considering at a whole core level that might introduce some additional IPD uh, capacity at a low latency where, but then there are certain barriers to it. Uh, there are policy barriers, regulatory barriers on, on, on all, all top of them. So I think the activity at the access end, uh, no matter how aggressive that activity is, uh, the industry has done wonderfully well in managing that through caches and deployment of um, you know compute pops and all that kind of infrastructure. Um, but the growth on these, the other level, the orchestration between data center to data center and connectivity hubs and connectivity hubs and uh, cloud, uh, what you call um, cloud centers, what they call 30 megawatt, 40 megawatt cloud mm -hmm. centers, those and the machines between that, that will continue to grow because the more and more businesses and enterprises are going digital, the more and more user experiences are going digital and all that requires a lot of machiness between all these connectivity hubs. When you mention about cloud to cloud, DC to DC connectivity, are you referring to a domestic cloud? Because in a bigger countries like let's say, or, or a bigger continents like Europe, where it is terrestrially connected, those places, it's easy, different, don't have any issue. But when it comes to a subsea kind of uh, um, like context, so like say connecting um, like two, three different countries and when the DC is, let's say Hong Kong and then in Singapore, how do you actually interconnect? Then the pipe, the, the bandwidth restriction comes into play. So do you refer to only domestic or you are dom referring to international? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's generally international, okay. uh, but obviously Europe has done a wonderful job of making it like a terrestrial network, connecting all the countries. Still, there is, I think, the demand on the transatlantic outweighs any other demand in any True. other corridor in the world. True. So that is a clear indication that no matter how much well you are connected terrestrially, it's a global world. So you still need to connect back to different continents. And that demand continues to kind of grow. Uh, but it makes it much easier within Europe to connect different connectivity hubs from Marseille all the way to uh, Lulia in Sweden. You can find some terrestrial solutions and some 
uh, unrepeated um, subsea solutions, which are treated as as, as terrestrial in, in by all means and purposes. But when it comes to Asia, um, that facility or that totally different. It's different. Even the countries which have borders have traditionally struggled to provide stable international connectivity on a dry plant. Um, and the classic example would be um, one could on the map draw a line from Singapore all the way to Central Asia because mm -hmm. it's all land connected. But mm -hmm. it's a probably it will be a miracle uh, and it will require another 50, 100 years for humanity to kind of understand that how beneficial that would That's be. What, exactly. But it's not there. And even in the countries which are very friendly, the ASEAN countries, they have done wonderfully well in terms of the trade. I think they have not been able to translate that collaboration into the infrastructure on the digital side. So that the subsea remains the only viable option to connect these countries. And obviously it has limitation, but obviously we discussed in the other as part of the discussion that how the models have evolved. I think technology has a lot to do with uh, the models have involved instead of having long multiple uh, like systems, I think there's a the high capacity systems with high fiber count, and I think that would be the order of the of of the decade uh, moving forward from now to 2030. Okay, great, thank you. That gives a lot of insight about how things would look like in terms of digital demand and in the future digital demand. Um, Keith, your opinion on this? The we for OMS, uh, my parent company, we uh, we are taking over the ships that used to be owned by all the big old companies. Okay, right. that's number one. Right. Number two, less and less consortium because, because consortium always have a problem getting agree where to meet and where to eat. Yeah, yeah true. So do, not even talking about laying the cable. So we see the trend for more private cable, true. one or two uh, users or uh, co-users. And the other big thing that has been facing uh, for uh, OMS that is because of the South China Sea issue. So uh, Southeast Asia, North Asia, it's the biggest internet market around the world, right? Uh, the sea lanes are very busy, but laying a cable now is a problem. Yeah. So, um, but the talk is that when there is a problem, there is always a way around it. So even if you say, yeah, I cannot lay from there, we will We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll build around it. We can go underneath, go right, go down, go under the sea, go under the, the 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 earth. So, so I don't see any issue. But talking about bandwidth growth, uh, you know the equipment that we light up for the cables uh, is going higher and higher and higher. They're packing more and more. You know, I think one fiber pair can do eighteen terabit. You know, true. Yeah. So, uh, local loop. If local loop don't increase. Subsea capacity, one fiber pair can do 18 terabit. Then local loop still do 100G, cannot That's be, true. right? So it will all follow together. So when subsea capacity goes into <laughs> terabit, local loop will also go into terabit. I, I started selling bandwidth was E1, you know. I don't know what's <laughs> E1 these days. Anybody know what's E1? These days, 100 gig. But I think in another few more years, it's all one terabyte uh, ports, you know. So, and subsea will lead, but local loop will also be one terabyte, yeah. And I, when I was selling bandwidth in another country, we used to, oh, 10 meg, 10 meg, 10 meg. I said, please don't talk 10 meg now. 10 meg cannot get us out of the chair. True. So I see the trend. The market demand will push the ingenuity of humanity. I always say that technical, not an issue. Laws, not an issue. Cabo touch, not an issue. We always be around it. Good. Um, good. Very good. Thanks for the insight, which is we had been talking on the majorly on the capacity planning and all. You had been on, on the implementation side, how that can be mitigated. Thanks for the insight. This brings to us to the second question. What are some innovative new business models uh, which can capitalize on the growing digital demand of the cable services? So this one, I would ask Ubed if you want to add something here. Yeah, I think the I would I wouldn't say that there are entirely new business models like investment models in the submarine um, have been pretty similar since the dot com bubble of two thousand. 
Um, it's always been driven by um, carriers, um, the global carriers, and then uh, um, in, in the last decade or so, the cloud and application provider. And the only major change that has come, um, uh, and as, as I was referring to before, uh, the cables are going high capacity. So we are talking about, we've already um, demonstrated like half of PWT cables across transatlantic. I think there was a discussion um, in multiple conferences about um, a, a roadmap to a petabit cap cable. But I think moving forward, uh, what what looks like that will be smaller consortiums rather than those classic 16, 16 18, 18, 18, 18 consortium, consortium yeah. where just getting, you know, a yes from around the table trick takes you like two hours. Right. Uh, it will be like much more nimble uh, consortium where it's like a high stake poker table that not everyone is invited because the minimum stake is to put as a million dollars. So like you need to have at least two fiber pair demand to come into the club and do this because like a small nimble consortium that's working through. Uh, but that consortium does not mean that it's just isolating the industry because wholesalers on those consortium will open up um, their fiber pairs in a small bits and pieces to the industry. And I think they will go for high fiber count um, STM uh, networks where which will provide high capacity and will slightly future proof it by not very long, but they will slightly future proof it like for 20, 25 years in terms of capacity. Uh, the other thing that I has that, that which I think the industry is moving towards is uh, finding more eco-friendly ways of building these submarine networks. I think there's a larger understanding and consciousness about it. Um, there has been uh, demonstrations of some sail drones where the survey vessels are, you know, self-drive survey vessels based on um, solar energy. That opens up a lot of possibilities of doing surveys for a larger corridor, different ways, uh, and process it in different ways. Um, and then I think what are some of the panelists have, I think submarine has graduated from from a mu base like a unit to the fiber count or the fiber pair. Unfortunately, the terrestrial side has not. It still is a lit capacity versus lit capacity, which doesn't make sense. Uh, I think the countries from the regulatory perspective and also the carriers from that perspective, they need to productify the dark fiber. Otherwise, it will always be the dry plant will always be the limiting factor. Um, and that is something that we are looking at. There will be more innovative investment models that will come in where carriers of carrier will come into some of these uh, countries and then offer the dark fiber as a product level. And then you can buy 10 or 12, like you, you do in Europe or you do in North America. You can just buy fiber counts and pullovers and maybe the duct space. And that's that's how the business models have evolved. So I think that has not come into Asia. Um, I think it's just high time that it should. This is actually uh, like when you mentioned about a bigger consortium, this reminds me to an older case study live, still the cable is still live, Simi V3. Imagine how many consortium owners had been there to build this. And, and all the people who had been traditionally a part of the telecom industry would be knowing that Simi V3 has been still existing, but we had different amount of challenges when it goes down in a specific section, then the, the outage isolation and the repair time takes a lot of time. So that's a very good point. Just to add one, like I'm not saying, and at that time, that was probably the most optimized exactly. model of doing it exactly. because those were bigger exactly. investments and people wanted to share the risk of the investment. And I think that was the right time and right way to do it. Uh, and I'm not undermining anything that has happened then. And I think there would be still some possibilities of a larger consortium in certain uh, regions and corridors because there will always be a smaller um, pipes needed to certain countries and certain islands, which can only be fulfilled with a larger consortium. Exactly. So that that will exist, that will right. coexist. I just think that will not be the, that will be an exception rather than a norm uh, moving forward because the need for the pipes has increased uh, drastically. Right. Thomas, you I think I'm um, uh, echoing what was just said uh, earlier. Uh, the new business model, uh, traditional, which is like tele telecom going in, long-term investment, multiple uh, parties in consortium, but now the new business model is very much um, DC to DC mm -hmm. and connecting con connectivity between the clouds in the region. So I would see that the new business model would be uh, partnering with the, the hyperscalers 
or even if not the top tier one, the, the, the tier two content providers in the region or in each individual country, and maybe also look for a, a tier two local telco partner for the uh, the local terrestrial fiber part. That would be the model together because when all the, all the parties are there, there is also demand already uh, in place. In, instead of just putting the cable there and hope for the best, let's see, put, uh, push your sales team to sell. Right. Because now we see the demand already. So it's just including the people with the demand together. Right. Um, Asmara, your opinion? No, I'm quite interested when Ubet mentioned about uh, the current infrastructure is a bit changed. Not, not a bit, a big change. When we're talking about five years ago, all the cable landing station, SLTE, whatever, was inside the cable landing station. True. But the new innovation is uh, people want to be open. They don't want to go to the cable, to the cable landing station, same like going to the prisoner, <laughs> right? True. You will have uh, some problem <laughs> with, with cross-connect charging, whatever. So now we have an open cable system, right? With the new open cable interface, whatever, you, you name it, OCI or what. So this is a very good for the industry. Does it really uh, push you to this understanding that when you are having an OCI, uh, open cable interconnect, uh, does it really push you to a point wherein, let's say, a hyperscaler like Meta or anybody else would push to choose, uh, would get pushed to choose a partner in that country where the cable is landing, or okay. they yes. would have that legacy to terminate on their own because not everybody will have their own regulatory standpoint on the yes, internet. Exactly, every exactly that's country. what I'm going to say because right. the regulatory is a bit different. Each country right. have different regulatory. For Correct. example, like in Japan, they consider SLT as a part of a wet segment. Absolutely. Not Absolutely. the dry plan, right? You see the now DC to DC cable. You don't have that CLS termination and then another uh, leg which is the backhaul. Yes. So is it something which... Um, a, a, a hyperscaler should choose or a cable investor, investor should choose where he he or, or they are planning to land that particular cable would be uh, specific to a telecom operator or it can be somebody else in that country who is definitely a country provider. It can be anybody. It need not be a telco, right? Uh, first, thing we, first thing we need to learn about the regulatory in each country. Right. You can you can imagine like for example to Africa right. project. Right. To Africa. Yep. Yeah. We have a um, Meta and CMI invest. We have 36 cable landing station. True. Not all the cable landing station uh, can allow the, the regulatory allow right. them to, to put the SLT in the what what we call as a carrier neutral data center. Okay. What is a carrier neutral data, data center? We don't know. So it's really subject uh it's country specific. Yes, in the end, we just go first, and then we work together with the regulatory, side by side together with the partner in the I mean a local provider. So it's a it's a not really a chicken and egg story. You look for a a, a partner first who would be possibly a cable partner uh, or a capable partner on the in that particular country, and then work on the regulatory standpoint to clear the licenses and stuff. I, I think, sorry, if, if, I, if I may, I think it's like, look at from the, the other side of the coin. I think it's the race to relevance. Okay. Uh, it's not a coincidence that all the connectivity hubs internationally not only have an open interconnect regime, they also have a regulatory regime where you can own the dark fiber terrestrially, you can own the backbone fiber, and you can also own your own equipment and manage it. Uh, obviously, there are certain norms and certain regulatory considerations that you need to, uh, uh, you know, take care of. But it's not a coincidence. And uh, the classic example is is Oman. They, for a very long time, they had this view of protectionism and nationalism, and they were the first country in the Middle East that opened up and made the open interconnect as a policy regime. And now suddenly everyone is talking about as Muscat and Salala to be the, the Marseille Point. of Asia. Exactly. And it's not a coincidence. And I think the, the the regulators and the what you call incumbent carriers need to think from that point of view that it's the race to relevance. The earlier you um you you open up your regulatory regimes, be more open open-minded about it, 
open cables have established i think and i think some of the credit should be given to the caps and and the larger wholesalers that we have pushed for it industry to go in that direction but open interconnect is the next step and that is more to do with like step has to be taken by the governments and the incumbent operators for the larger uh, you know good for the industry and also larger business opportunity like when when Sing Singapore opened up for the open cable, I'm not sure that Singtel was all supportive of it or should not be at that time that the models were different. But look at how they have rode on that wave and have considerable influence in the industry. And they've also had different business models that they've enabled it. And I think all the countries should look at that the internet generally requires many more connectivity hubs than a couple in Asia serving two 2.5 billion population. So I think it's more about the race to relevance uh, for each country to look at. You are absolutely right, Sahit and, and Asmal, um, Asmara and, and Thomas. Breakout is a very important point because we always had been traditionally, when, when we were not connected to so many small, small different countries, we always used to take Singapore as a hub, Hong Kong as a hub, US as a hub, or Europe as a hub. <laughs> Traditionally, if you see that these hubs, if you break into multiple smaller hubs, it gives you much more resiliency in terms of IP and you can have a breakout, you can connect to some other alternate route and reach to your destination. Now, this is exactly what is traditionally happening in, in, the, in the global uh, footprints in terms of network infrastructure. So people are now looking at Philippines as a breakout point. People are looking at Indonesia as a breakout point because the cluster and the, and the more... Uh, Cables, when they are getting interconnected in one point, that becomes an USP of that particular country to have diversification and bring the traffic and segregate the traffic for the alternate route. So it is it is uh, for majorly for the transit carriers. Yeah, this this actually um, gets gets to uh, gets us to the second point um, of a very similar thing. Um, on this particular business side, what is the potential risk and challenges associated? with implementing new business models and investment strategies to meet uh, digital demand in the subsea cable industry. Who wants to I, I try to answer this. You know, uh, yesterday, I have a very interesting conversation with a data center uh, constructor or builder. He said, Keith, our challenge is not building. Our challenge is not the de demand. The demand and the content, the human business mind will go and create. It's very, where do you get power? That's number one. In fact, I've been joking with some of my friends. Uh, hey, maybe we should put a nuclear reactor in uh, Jurong Island. You know? <laughs> because we need the kind of power. you know. Uh, so now they're talking about building. And then the article came out from IMDA, Joseph, Josephine Wee. Yeah? Is mm -hmm. it Josephine? Dio, talking about power and selling it. And, and, and power is premium now, right? Right. Uh, you can have facility, okay, so much space, yeah. But your machine don't need too much space. It's the power. So the limit to the limit to the growth uh, of the telecom or content industry is, I think, is the power. Okay, the the equipment, the the, the fiber optics is not an issue. That's number one. So I think the next phase of the generation of power will be uh, to power all this uh, content and all this connectivity and open concept. The next generation of power generation. So the risk, what you anticipate is if you don't have adequate amount of power, we'll not be able Nothing to run. Nothing can it. be done, right? You have no power, you know. So so I think maybe, uh, I'm talking aloud, I'm uh, talking, uh, maybe Singapore government will put a nuclear reactor somewhere and say, look, there's more than enough power from there. Maybe, no. uh, don't, don't quote me, but I think we have to think about the next generation of power to create to power the next generation of content you know right. maybe next we don't have to fly anymore we just uh, put a hologram i'm standing in front of you i'm talking yeah high power mm. high high capacity needed you know and not just in the office but in the home you know okay so, so uh, lots of more things to think of I, you know when i first started i say oh the hubs are all in hong kong singapore right Tokyo, right? These days, uh, the cable hubs are where? You know? Guam. Another one I found out, Christmas Island. <laughs> you know, so, and another place will be, yeah, 
Africa, somewhere, uh, maybe in uh, Dubai, maybe in Oman. Yeah. So the industry is evolving, uh, evolving. And cables the last time take 10, 15 years to reach its design limit. Now. These days are uh, five years are uh, oh, finished. No, cannot upgrade anymore. You need a cable. No matter how much equipment you put, you cannot upgrade it because this, this is finite, right? So I say the sky is the limit. Yeah, we haven't reached that, but we are seeing it from afar that cables will be, be well, infrastructure, cable, backhaul, all has to be built every five years because the demand is doubling, 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 you know. Not times two, but exponential times, times to the square, to the square, yeah. So... Am I talking nonsense? <laughs> no, no, good one. So your, your power demand is well taken, which is very crucial for uh, running any particular active or passive element in the in the system. Uh, Thomas, your point? Um, I'll bring it back to the cables. Um, I would like to echo about the, the open interconnect. That is exactly um, what we are also thinking about because uh, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, we... What HEC is looking into uh, in the cable investment is partnering with content providers or hyperscalers mm -hmm. as the anchor customer. And our experience is the more anchor customer I can bring in, the sooner I get return on investment. Mm -hmm. And the more anchor customers I can bring in, I need the open interconnect. Otherwise, no one was going to come. I mean, today, the industry is very transparent. There's no more secret in, in subsea cable capacity, fiber pairs and all that versus 20 years ago. So my point is... um. Having the, the openness and flexibility to bring in the anchor customers who are also the demand drivers. Right. So in terms of the potential risk, you think that faster we can uh, like monetize these things, we'll be able to um, get the ROI well or in terms of this new implementation, like if, if the project takes a lot of time, you have more demand in the back end and you cannot fulfill that because your client might have to choose something else. Yeah. So is that what your... Yeah, I think the risk is, is also okay. that, um, for example, there are some cables that we know about that are taking too long to build mm -hmm. or to, to uh, be ready of surface. And of course, the demand has been on bad lock, but there are other new cables being built. And once those cables come into a uh, surface, that backlog will clear out. So you so, have to get the timing right as well. So Ubed, your insight on this potential risk on the challenge associated to the implementation? Yeah, I think um, so. There, there are two points I would like to mention. One is obviously it's it's a challenging industry, and we all know it, that things are a lot more things are out of your control. Um, I think regulatory and international um, geopolitics has has a lot of uh, kind of uh, you know what you call upcoming challenges that is coming through. I think as an industry, there should be a way uh, or or as a as a as a as a humanity, there should be a way to kind of provide exception uh, to the communication cables as like more neutral thing rather than using it um, for 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 like a, for nationalism or protectionism per se. Uh, so those things will will continue to evolve. I think there is a larger uh, challenge that submarine industries face is, uh, and if you look at from there, like more and more sea space is being used for renewable energy. So the, mm -hmm. the, the wind farms in the English Channel and around the European shores is, is, is providing a challenge for the space available to put or stall the submarine cables and maintain them adequately. I think that is something that will come in challenge because most of the challenge comes through the shore end for the submarine cables. And that's where submarine cables meets the, the renewable energy um, forms. And I think there has to be a better way of managing uh, the, the the space constraint in those those regions. The third thing is um, the and which is the largest uh, ONM challenge for the submarine industry is uh, fishing uh, and how it is oh, done. Nice. Uh, the trawlers themselves or the fads that are installed, uh, especially in Asia, and those are th those result in the majority of the cable cuts. Um, and I think a more more, you know, organized approach or more al allocation of the fishing areas would would certainly help. Uh, but apart from this, I think the challenge, uh, as we discussed in detail, is the bigger pipes might lend to the shore, but there will be a smaller pipes connecting shore 
to the real customers or the or the data centers and that has to be fixed um, and i think as a whole industry has to do a, a bit more better job of marketing the the benefits of this this infrastructure um, none of the private equity or the big private equity, equity players are in the submarine industry at the moment since uh, the the dot com bubble bust of 2000 and I think as an industry, we need to do a better phenomenal job of kind of marketing the industry that it still is essential, still is lucrative, still is so that more and more. And the why we need that capital to be injected into submarine because this capital generally has um, more influence in terms of the regulations because banks and private equity players are considered uh, more closer to the regulators, more neutral uh, to the regulators, and they don't. They, they listen some of them so i think the whole industry is already talking to regulators in from the multiple fronts i think another uh, direction of uh, of that 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 story should come in and i think private equity can do that job but the problem is that private equity doesn't trust the industry because all we do is come to the panels and say oh this is wrong about industry these are the risks and these are the but what we forgot to tell the story that it still is super essential to have the submarine and it's still 95% of the world traffic goes through the submarine network and they provide those pipes. So it's just like a, it's just like an essential human need and it still is the most reliable way to communicate between continents. So it's not going away anywhere. Saying is uh, you forget toothbrush, you don't forget your mobile phone and look for internet Wi-Fi hotspots. So that's how things are today. So, uh, so that's that's uh, important key thing, which is on the on the physical challenge in terms of any landing a cable, then sabotage, and a lot of other things which do happen in in the mar market in the subsea cable industry. But yes, um, these uh, these fishing things. So there is a multifold discussion on this uh, on the potential risk, which is you get a business which is already there with you and then you don't have capacity. And then you don't know how soon the capacity would get activated in the back end. You take an order from your customer, which is possibly you take up RFS date six months from now, you take the capacity, you say that, sir, it's coming, don't worry. And after that, nine months still, you don't get that capacity onboarded because of a lot of different like situation can be any reason. And because of regulatory, landing rights, multiple other things, which essentially contributes to the actual situation of, so the business risk is not only implementation, the business risk is also on the monetary loss, which you will incur. Yeah. So if you have taken any advance from the customer, then it would impact. I, I think what you said very, very poignant is that private equity, I, I'm seeing now, last few weeks, huh? Private equity are coming is coming in. They're preparing. This company, parent company, is one of the first few. Yes. But more are coming in. I just, oh, they are coming in. They are coming. These banks are coming in. They understand that the infrastructure uh, equity, uh, uh, money uh, has to come in to finance uh, this new wave uh, of uh, connectivity. So um, that's why I say more and more private cable, not consortium cable. More and more. Uh, private equity earning cable, building cable, build faster, decide faster, move. Exactly. RFS faster. Exactly. To meet the market. Okay, we all, we all started with uh, te telecom companies that, oh, we, you know, we form consortium, 15 consortium. Oh, 16, I, 17. 16, then, you know, they fight. That's like, we all, six of us, we go for lunch. You yeah, know, yeah, I got no time, you know, <laughs> then we fight. So, the trend will be uh, is making easier and easier now. And if private equity comes in, means uh, they say, okay, I give you the money, two billion dollar, okay, go and build. I want the whole package in. That's where white side OMS are uh, they're positioning that. Okay, you we build, we can light it up, and then we do backhaul, we do the cable landing stage, everything we do for you, one stop shop. That's private cap equity money. And private equity like us, you know, sorry, I, I, I think it's not a, uh, but it is coming already. It's already there. Yeah. Yeah. So we possibly need to identify the, before you launch a cable or you land a cable or you are in the planning stage, you need to get into all these risk factors. Unless you mitigate these risk factors, there could be a sudden 
uh, sudden potential untapped risk which will crop up and possibly it would lead to a longer lead time which possibly would impact the business. So that is something which we have foreseen in multiple cases. I would possibly not like to name the cables, but we have experienced this in past. In, in multiple places, people have um, capacities la land like waiting in the landing station, but because of the balancing of the capacity, people cannot lay, activate the capacity. So there had been multiple issues into the in the in the specific industry and in into our business, which has somehow contributed different ways of potential loss in terms of somebody's business. So we need to be very careful about this. That's thanks for individual input. Every input was quite unique and different. And that gives us a good amount of understanding about the points. I, I, I think, the, I, I think I'll be radical. The coming years, uh, it is not the regulatory that will lead the industry. It is the business people who will lead the industry. And they will tell the regulatory, you need to do this, do this, 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 this. You know, I see a lot of issues in Singapore landing. Only this particular slot, only the particular slot, because our coastline is so so lucrative doing yeah. shipping. What is fishing? Fishing doesn't really bring money, but internet content, internet connectivity brings billions and billions of dollars. So I see business leading the regulatory. Okay, you need to do this. You need to regulate this. You need to control this so that we can build faster infrastructure for the market so that we can make more money for the country uh, or for all the companies. I, I see there will be a trend. Maybe some of us will be, we'll go and advise the regulatory, you know, sit on the board, yeah? Why not? Yeah, so let's think a bit further. You know. Beyond, go beyond. Go beyond. Yeah, I think the, the risk was always there. Right. Our, our industry is always challenging industry. You see, in one side, the country said uh, digitalization. But in other side, like for example, like Indonesia, <laughs> right? Jokowi said digitalization is number important. But in other side, they put what? <laughs> corridor. The corridor with the with the corridor. barrier, yeah. you can't it's, enter the- It's a killing, for and killing us, but what? We always overcome this. Right. Yeah. So he, he mentioned, he mentioned that there is always a, a workaround for everything and we figure it out. So there are ways and means to, uh, when we get a challenge, we try to overcome the challenge and how you overcome that could be on, on, a, on, a, on the basis of some, some unique uh, route you follow or you implement or you go around about a, a policy and then you find to fix that. So they, we, we had been working around on this model for ages and we are quite experienced in that, the whole, whole people on the telecom fraternity. Now, um, we have not much time left on this. Any questions from the uh, from the audience? Anyone has any questions? Like one. <laughs> Anyone? Like one. Has any specific questions? So. Sorry, <laughs> we have this private joke. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, if not, if not any question, then I have my last question to ask you guys. How do you judge the success of your investment in a system? And in one question, I'm actually adding two questions. And what can you do differently next time? So these are the two questions merge into one. I leave it to you guys, whoever wants to answer this. I'll repeat once again. How do you judge your success of investment in a system? And then what would you do differently next time? I think... Obviously, every investor has a different set of KPIs to look at. Um, I can speak uh, on behalf of Meta that our the way we judge our success is not only the amount of capacity that we can draw down from a system, but that what how do we push the boundaries with every system that we build, uh, how much we contribute to the healthy ecosystem of the net, and I think uh, it's. We have been pushing for open cables for a very long time. It's good to see that that concept is thriving now. We have been pushing in terms of increasing or enhancing the capacity on a per fiber pair basis. I'm not saying that we have already on the Shannon's limit, but we are very close to the theoretical limit. 
uh, and I think there is a lot of effort has been put in um, by Meta in that direction. So we believe that was one of the KPIs we were looking at that how much each of our system is contributing to a healthy internet ecosystem, how much we are contributing back to the industry in terms of providing industry with something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then moving to the high fiber count systems, I think that is another uh, area that we, we believe that we are trendsetters there. So I think that is one of the key things we look at. Uh, the other thing that how many new innovations we are bringing with each system. So we have been very uh, vocal about green energy or powered by the green energy or looking at the zero um, uh, carbon, carbon emission or carbon neutrality. Uh, we have a very aggressive uh, commitment as a company uh, for uh, you know uh, water and carbon neutrality by 2025, and there's a lot of work has been done in that direction. Uh, we are also incubating some of these ideas like power buoy. If if, if you are aware of, there is our uh, sea installed um, uh, uh, solar powered buoys that can actually power. Uh, or provide uh, the alternative power uh, for in case of double cable cuts. Uh, that has been an innovation that we are, we are incubating. Uh, we are also pushing for the sail drone, as I mentioned earlier. So there are, I think for us, it's not only the capacity we draw down or bring our cost per terabit down, that obviously is our, our, our own uh, business KPI, but how much we are contributing back to the industry, how much we are contributing to the healthy internet ecosystem. And all the while we have been like, we are also enabling some of these carriers and countries that previously didn't had access to bigger international pipes. And I think to Africa is the classic example. It was it's more of philanthropic kind of thing. Yeah. And you extending it. Uh, better led to... uh, project, but the primary goal was to build a healthy ecosystem in Africa. And it's not to buy subsidy or from that model, but to provide opportunities for these carriers to participate in a bigger pipe and then can actually part uh, you know pass on that those savings back to their users and customers great so it is a unique thought you know uh, meta being a specific hyperscaler who has been traditionally serving specifically on a on a collective mass in each and every country and whoever has a a, a mobile a smartphone cannot he can miss any other application but cannot miss Facebook or associated apps, whatever they have. So with that, um, it is a very prudent point that you are give, you are using the subsea cable as your own capacity and also giving back something to the society, keeping in mind those basic parameters which will not, uh, not interfere with the current ecosystem contributing it, not, not contributing any carbon to the society and making it more green. That is a well uh, point taken. Asmara, your point for uh, this this uh, opinion for this particular point. I'm not a service guy, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just a project manager. So, <laughs> so it's asking to me how I judge the success. First, of course, uh, you, this is your point. May, basically, if you d design a particular cable, the success actually rides on your shoulder. Yes. The money is given by somebody else, but <laughs> you are the man who is driving. So when, when we build the submarine cable from the scrap, right, we start from a coffee shop together with some friends. Right. Yeah, let's, let's build together. And then we form from two to three, three to five. True. Then from five become 16. You see see me with, see me with three, 13. 16. Right? right. So, how I judge the success is actually how we can deliver the faster, deliver the service, follow the plan of work. True. But it's almost zero case. <laughs> the in the submarine cable industry, the RFS state is follow the the plan of work. But that's okay. But the thing is, I think that another success judge, uh, the successful case that we need to think when I think is success when I can deliver it. That's number one. Number two, the system should be better than than the system before because we learn from what we learn from the mistake, right? Right. So the marine engineering, 
everything should be much better than before project. Right. So that's the only thing uh, I think what, what I feel personally that how I judge the success of that. Okay. Thank you. Point taken. Thank you. Thomas? Okay. I think I'm echoing what Keith was saying. Um, business has to be driving the regulatory. And even like if we get on, uh, some of us uh, people get on the, the advice board for the regulatories. So the way I, I, I see that uh, to judge the success of a, a cable system is the overall uh, benefit to the development of the digital economy right. of the regions or the countries that the cable system touches. Obviously, a lot of, uh, still a lot of demand potential for mm. a lot of different Asian countries. So if we build a cable, goes to certain countries, it will have to benefit the overall um, digital economy there. Because what the cable systems are now, they are basically trade routes of what traditional trade routes are, trade routes are in the last few centuries. But now everything's happening on digital. So the cables are the trade routes. Right. Keith? I, I still think about power because uh, <laughs> the convergence of telco and businesses and content are already there. They converge together. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be convergence of uh, ecosystem, right? Power system, okay? Power generation, content, holding the memory base of so much content. And of course, cable ship suppliers like us. So all the component of it, there'll be convergence. So maybe the next time I will see another conference, a big conference, then we see all the ecosystem suppliers down there. And then we come up with a solution faster, cheaper, and more. Yeah. So I think that will be the success story of the of the connectivity business or the connectivity industry. Okay, so, so to summarize this, thank you, uh, Keith. Uh, to summarize this, um, we have a couple of six, seven questions asked, and we 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 came we initiated with the business models we understood about the potential risk of the uh, subsea cables we understood the demand of the subsea cables we understood the planning and the and the way the private equity or the regulatory should actually step in and make the uh, individual project more successful and capable for for the betterment for of the industry on a very short lead time rather than on an elongated time, which would uh, which would have a lot of uh, difficulty for any business to uh, start because business is money, and and time is money. So when when you are actually operating on a business which is having a stipulated time frame to deliver, then you really don't have uh, and and you have penalties and SLAs added to that. Then it really creates an issue for any business owner. To have a dependency on a on a subsea cable or, or which would be a which would be a e-commerce or a digital lifeline for them to run the business. So um, to to that extent, if, uh, people need to be more diligent during the planning stage so that they know that uh, this particular cable will have this kind of challenges, so that they should mitigate those points and ensure and keep a buffer in terms of the delivery, so that they know that. If they default also, they will be able to deliver it on the due. If it is early, people will be more than happy to like undercommit and over deliver. So it's it's good for anybody to have that kind of model. So I guess um, we have reached to a place where we have had enough discussion on the on the strategies and investment of subsea cable for the future digital demand. I personally thank you everyone for being there and getting into this particular panel session and uh, hope it could be a useful session for everyone. And uh, that's all, thank you very much.